Okay, I hope you guys can see me. I'm recording. Uh, Dr. Wesley, uh, well, welcome to our first class of numerical analysis since spring break, right? A lot of things have changed um, <laughs> from for what it was before. And so, yeah, we have to change with the times. Uh, well, you, I miss you guys. I uh, wish you guys were here with me, but that's not the case. So, we just have to deal with it. Uh, well, so since there's, I'm essentially teaching to a class that is empty, right? I decided to have two teddy bears take your place. So I have two teddy bears that are staring at me right now. They're taking your place. One is called Buford, the other one is called Gwendolyn. Um, and they're taking your place. They're looking at me, giving me all your love that you guys are showing to me uh, while you're gone. And hopefully I'll see you guys in the, um, in the fall. So anyway, let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We praise you, Father God, for your goodness, Lord. And we pray, Father God, that you bless this time, that you make this time yours, Lord God. Pray for, for, for the students who are all over the country, Lord God, who are um, looking at this video, Father God, who are away, maybe in areas and maybe they're scared or maybe they're, uh, maybe they're just tired of just all this mess that's going on, and all the negativity, Lord God. We just pray, Father God, for the right, Lord God. We pray for peace in the midst of all these situations and the circumstances that they may be facing, Lord God. Give me the words you would have me speak, Lord God. Give us all listening ears, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so before I continue, let me make sure that this thing is recording correctly, all right? So I'm gonna come back here just real quickly. Okay, all right, so I think it's recording, so let's get started. Uh, if you guys remember, before the break, we were talking about um, splines, right? That was the last thing we were talking about. And I want to do just like a little brief recap about what we did last time. So let's get started. We're in section 3.5, splines. Okay. Our topics for today. One is gonna be linear splines. We talked about this um, before spring break, linear splines. Just gonna do an uh, example that I did at the, um, at the last time we had classes before spring break. I just do that example again. Two, we're gonna talk about quadratic splines. And three, we're gonna talk about cubic splines. So linear splines, quadratic splines, and cubic splines are what we're gonna be talking about today, okay? And we're just gonna go ahead and get started, just kind of a recap of what we did last time. This should already be in your notes, but let's just look at it, right? When we're dealing with a spline, right? I wanna be able to find the linear spline. Going through the points and here I have the points 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 5, okay. So I'm going to find the linear spline going through the points 1, 2, 2, 3, and 3, 5. Right, and remember that what this is, is that we're essentially connecting straight lines, right, between these points. So I have one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. I know they're not to scale. Let me make this a little bit more to scale. Okay. So we have one, two, this point right here. Two, three, just over here, and then three, five over here. And what we're looking at are those line segments between connecting this guy to make our spline. Right? We have these line segments, and we said that our spline, if we have just two parts right here, we have two piece. Uh, we have a piecewise function that has two individual line functions that connect to make this spline. And so what we're looking at is a function that looks like this. S of x is equal to, here we have a sub zero, x 
plus V sub zero, okay? My first linear function. And that function is going from one to two along the x-axis. And then we have another function, a1x plus b1, and that function goes from two to three. Three. And what we said, if you guys remember last time, we gave that each one of these individual functions we can give a name, so we can call the first one s of zero x, right? A sub zero x plus b sub zero, and s of one x, which is a sub one x plus b sub one. Okay, these are my two individual linear functions, right? And what we want to do is we want to make sure that. Essentially, this function just has to connect, right? These two line functions have to connect together. So we have conditions on our functions. Conditions. On the spline here. And the first one is that, essentially what we wanna do is we just wanna make sure that at those points, my spline is equal to my function value at that place, right? So here I have to have that S sub i and T sub i, each one of these values was 1, 2, and 3, represent my T0, T1, T2. It's been a while since we talked about that. It's equal to F of T sub i, my function value at that location, which would be 2 in this, look, in this, in this situation. And S of i at T of i plus 1 has to be equal to f of t sub i plus 1. Okay. So essentially at this location, at 2, I need my function to be equal to 3, right? So for this first one, I need it to be equal to one, uh, 2 at 1 and 3 at 2, okay? And these are called essentially my interpolation constraints. interpolation constraints, right? These are my interpolation constraints, meaning that I want to make sure that my spline goes through these points. That's what we mean by interpolation constraints. I want to make sure that my spline goes through these points. The nice thing about this, if my spline goes through these points, then my function is going to connect at that location, right? My function is going to connect because I'm guaranteeing that my spline has to go through those points. So for in our situation, what we have, if we look at it, this is what we want to see in our example. Just kind of recapping what we did before. This is a little bit different from how I did it last time, but we're going to get the same thing. We have to have that S of 0 at the value of 1 should be equal to 2. Okay. S of 0 at the value of 1 should be equal to 2. S of 0 at the value of 2 should be equal to 3. Okay, so here just kind of making sure that we all have a complete understanding of what's going on, or as best we can. Again, this is going to be S sub 0 x, and this guy is S sub 1 of x. S sub 1 of x. So S of 1 at 2 should be equal to 3. That guarantees that these guys are going to connect, right? So that I get a function that is going to be continuous, right? Because S of 0, 2, and S of 1 and 2 are both 3. And then S of 1 at 3 is equal to 5. Okay. So this is what we did last time. Okay, so these are my conditions. These are all the conditions that I need to be able to guarantee. These are my interpolation constraints. That guarantees that it's going to connect. Let's plug in to my function, right? So let's plug in and see what we get. We're going to end up with a system of equations. System of equations. All right, so when I plug in 1 into s of 0, right, just, just like we did last time, we get a sub 0 plus b sub 0 has to be equal to 2. 
plug in 2 into s of 0, right? We get 2 a sub 0 plus b sub 0 has to be equal to 3. Okay. Plug 1, um, 2 into s sub 1, we get 2 a sub 1 plus b sub 1 is equal to 3. Okay. So just kind of like we did before, no big deal, hopefully. Breathe in, breathe out. And then if we plug 3 into s sub 1, we get 3a sub 1 plus b sub 1 is equal to 5. All right. Now notice that I have four, I have four variables. So notice we have four variables. Four variables. A0, B0, A1, and B1. Okay. If I want to be able to solve a system of equations and I have four variables, I need to make sure that I have four equations. And do I have four equations? And the answer is, yes, I do. I do have four equations, right? One, two, three, four. So I need four equations with my system. I do indeed have four equations, right? I have four variables. I need to solve for those unknowns, right? I have four equations that let me solve it. And I'm going to do, again, a little bit different from what I did before because I want to be able to expand this idea to quadratic and cubic functions, or cubic splines. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an augmented matrix, right? You guys have probably seen this in linear algebra. So I have essentially my A0 terms, my B0 terms, my A1 terms, my B1 terms, and my constant terms. Right? If you, I know all of you guys are taking linear algebra, right? So I'm going to have four rows, five columns. Going across, right, my coefficients of my A0 terms is going to be 1, 1. No A1 terms in the first equation. 0, 0, and then I have a constant of 2. Okay. My second equation, my A0 term is, has a coefficient of 2, then 1, 0 for A1, and B1, and 3 goes here. And last but not least, well not last, we have two more to go, right? Uh, last two rows, right, I have 0, 0, 2, 1, 3, and then the last one is 0, 0, 3, 1, 5. And I'm going to stick this into my calculator, right, type this into my calculator, I'm going to do reduce row echelon form, reduce row echelon form get what this is, right? When I put it to reduce row echelon form, I should get what the solution is going to be for this particular system, okay? So I'm going to do reduce row echelon form, just like you did in linear algebra, reduce row echelon form. Okay. When I do reduce row echelon form, what do I end up with, right? That's the question. What do I end up with? And I, if you type it in, you should get something that looks like this. 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. 0, 0, 1, 0, 2. 0, 0, 0, 1, negative 1. And this tells me the same thing. Now I can read off, this is still the A0 column, this is still the B0 column, this is the C0, uh, A1 column, B1 column, this is the constant columns. So my solution, when I work it out, my solution, now that I have it in this reduced row echelon form, is going to be that A0 is equal to 1. B0 is equal to 1. A1 is equal to, in this case, 2. And B1 is equal to negative 1. Okay, this is what I get. So what is my spline? What's my linear spline look like? We have the S of X is equal to, reading off, right, plugging in our values, we get X plus 1. X goes from 1 to 2. The other one is going to be 2x minus 1. x goes from 2 to 3. So here's my spline. 
my land supply. Kind of a recap of what we did before. If you look in your notes, you'll probably see this exact same problem, right? We did it slightly different, but the same, same thing, same way of, of solving, right? We get the same system that we got last time we did it. And so here's my solution. Here's my linear supply. And again, I want to reiterate to be able to solve this because we had four variables, right? We needed four equations to be able to solve this uh, system. Okay. So the question is, okay, I can do lines, right? But lines are not that great, right? It's not very good in really approximating my, my uh, function that I might be trying to approximate here. With, maybe these are, these are my function values, right? In particular uh, values of x, right? So I want to be able to approximate this as best I can. Lines are not really that great for doing that, right? So it said, okay, well, instead of using lines, why can't we use quadratic functions? So we can. So let's, let's see if we can do quadratic functions. Quadratic functions. So let's ask the same question. I want to find the quadratic spline. Quadratic spline. Going through the points. One, two, two, three, and three, five. So in this situation, I'm going to draw a function here. I have one, two, two, one, two, two, three, three, five. And I have no idea how this is going to be, but just imagine it's something like this. I'm going to have quadratic functions, kind of linking these guys together like this. Here I have again s of 0 and x, and this is s of 1 and x. Okay. So I'm going to use a quadratic function for this, and I'm like, okay. All right, well, if I want to be able to uh, make a quadratic spline, then I should start off with something that might be a quadratic function. So I have s of x, in this case, is equal to, instead of having linear functions here, I'm going to have quadratic functions. So I'm going to have a sub 0 x squared plus b sub 0 x plus c sub 0. And that goes from where we have 1 to 2 for x. The second one is I have a sub 1 x squared plus b sub 1 x plus c sub 1. And here I have x go from 2 to 3, just like I had before. Again, I want to make sure, I want to make sure that my, pop, my spline connects, that it's continuous, that it's a continuous function. So I have the same thing I had before. Here, my s sub 0 x is going to be a sub 0 x squared plus b sub 0 x plus c sub 0. S1 of x is going to be a sub 1 x squared plus b sub 1 x plus c sub 1, right? Same thing. I want to make sure that these guys connect, right? So I still have that interpolation constraint that I had before, right? So let's put down our conditions here. Let's talk about what, con what conditions do I need? Just like we did last time. Definitely, definitely we want to make sure that our spline goes through those points that we have there. So we're going to have the same conditions that we had with the linear spline. We want to have that each one of these individual functions goes through those points. These are my interpolation constraints. But notice, for each one of my individual functions, for each one of my individual functions, how many, how many 
variables do I have? I mean, unknowns that I have. I have A0, B0, and C0, right? I have three unknowns, A0, B0, and C0. Here I only have two constraints, right? Which is going to only give me two equations when I do my system of equations. That's not enough. I need another constraint. I need another constraint so that I can have at least three constraints, uh, three constraints so I can solve for A0, B0, and C0. So I add another constraint. I'm saying, okay, I, I want to make sure that the polynomials connect, right? That's great. But let's say, okay, let's make sure that at the place where they connect, right? Here's an additional constraint. At the place where they connect, I want to make sure that their derivatives are equal to each other. So at the places where they connect, I want to make sure that their derivatives are equal to each other. So we're going to add that constraint as well. So here's the next constraint. We're going to say that s of i prime at t sub i plus 1 has to be equal to s sub i plus 1 prime at t sub i plus 1. And this is going to be a first derivative continuity constraint. First derivative continuity constraint here. We want to make sure that where they connect, at the location where these guys connect, that their first derivatives are equal to each other. We don't know what those first derivatives are, right? If we knew that, that would be great, but we don't, right? We want to make sure those first derivatives are equal at that location. So we have a first derivative constraint. Let's see if that's enough to be able to solve this problem. Let's write down what we have. Uh, just to conserve a little bit of space, okay, let me put them over here. Let's look at what we need to do. Let's take, let's take care of our interpolation constraints first, right? Just like we did before. We have to have that S of zero at one has to be equal to two, right? This is what we had last time. S of one at one has to be equal to, uh, of zero at two, sorry. has to be equal to 3, right? S of 0 at 2 has to be equal to 3. S of 1 at 2 also needs to be equal to 3, okay? And S of 1 at 3 is supposed to equal to 5. So that gives me, that gives me a total of four equations, right? Now let's add in our first derivative continuity constraint, meaning that at the location where they meet, I want their derivatives to be equal to each other. I want their derivatives to be equal, right? Then I have to have that S of 0 prime at the place where they meet is at the number 2 has to be equal to S of 1 prime at 2. How many constraints does that give me? Well, we know how to count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That is 5 equations that I'm going to get when I do this. How many unknowns do I have? How many unknowns do I have? I have six unknowns. I have six unknowns. I need another constraint, right? I need another constraint to be able to solve this system of equations, right? I need another constraint. To solve system, solve for unknowns. A0, B0, C0, A1, B1, C1. I have six of those guys. Now, what constraint do, what constraint do I, uh, can I use? You can use almost any constraint you want. You can, right? Most people do this. They say, OK, I need to find another place where the derivative, I want the derivative to be a certain value, right? So a lot of people just say, they easily say that at the initial point or at the end point, I want my derivative to be a certain value, OK? So what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing. We're going to add the additional constraint of this. We're going to say that the derivative at s sub 0, my first uh, individual function, at t sub 0 has to be equal to z naught, right? 
where z naught could be any real number. Any real number. Now, in this case, we're going to let z naught equal zero just because it's easy. Do we have to choose z naught to be equal to zero? No, we don't have to choose z naught to be equal to zero, but we, we allow z, uh, z naught to equal zero because we don't have any, any other information. If I actually knew what the function was, if I knew what the function was, maybe I could use the function value at that location. The function, the derivative of the function value at that location, right? So if I add this additional constraint, if I add that con uh, additional constraint, then what I get is this, I'm gonna put it down here. I have here that S sub zero prime at, what do we have here? Zero, or not, what's my T naught? One in this case. It's going to be equal to zero. So we can kind of think of this as an initial condition constraint. Initial condition constraint. And now guess what I have? One, two, three, four, five, six equations. And with those six equations, I should be able to find all six unknowns. So now that we have our six equations, right, let's fill it out. Let's, let's do it now. For the first one, if I plug one into S sub zero, I get, what is that going to be? Let's see. My system. I get A0 plus B0 plus C0 is equal to 2. Okay. If I plug 2 into S of 0, I get 4A0 plus 2B0 plus C0 is equal to 3. If I plug 2 into S of 1, I get 4A1 plus 2B1 plus C1 is equal to 3. If I plug 3 into S of 1, I get 9A1 plus 3B1 plus C1 is equal to 5. Okay. Now the other ones, the last two conditions, right, require me to know what the derivatives are. So let me find the derivatives right here. S prime of S sub zero prime is going to be equal to, take the derivative of this, 2A sub zero X plus B sub zero. S sub one prime is going to be 2A sub one X plus B sub one. Now that I know that information, we can find the last two equations, right? Plug 2 into S of 0, I get 4, A sub 0 plus B sub 0. It's equal to, plug 2 into S of 1 prime, I get 4, A sub 1 plus B sub 1. And finally, plug 1 into S sub 0 prime, and I get 2a sub 0 plus b sub 0 is equal to 0. That's a lot, isn't it? We haven't done, we haven't done the cubic spline, and, uh, and that's going to be a little bit more, more fun, as you can imagine. I might have to erase the board. I might have to erase some of the stuff over here. But I think we'll get, at least get this part in here, what we have right now. Okay, so what is my, what is my matrix look like, right? Let's, let's look at that real quick. So if I toss this into an augmented matrix, right? Solve this. I'm not gonna write down the reduced row echelon form. I'm just gonna write down the matrix that you need to type into your calculator. Again, a0, B0, C0, A1, B1, C1, constant. Notice that I'm going to have six rows 
and seven columns, six, ro six rows and seven columns, if I can talk. <laughs> Let's go across, see, if, hopefully you guys remember this from linear algebra. One, 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 zero, 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 two. Four, two, one, zero, 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 three. Four, two, one, zero. Oh, no, no, that's not right. It's not right, is it? You're like, that's not right, Dr. Wesley. Zero, 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 four, two, one, three. The other one is zero, 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 nine, three, one, five. And the last row, we gotta be careful here, it's gonna be four, one, zero. Now what goes here? Now remember, I need to bring everything over to the left-hand side. So this becomes a negative four, A1, minus B1, no C1, and zero, because that'll be zero on the right-hand side. There's no numbers besides zero on the right-hand side. And the last one is, here we have two, one, zero, 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 zero. Okay, this is what you need to type into your calculator, right? There's another way that, the, that you can do this problem using kind of an algorithm, but I think this is kind of an easy way to understand what's going on. We have these constraints, right? We have our interpolation constraints. We have to make sure that our function goes to those points, right? Our quadratic equations, our quadratic functions. We need to make sure that the first derivatives connect and we had to add an additional constraint. And we could have picked anything and this is the one we picked in this particular situation. What is going to be um, the solution to this? I'm not gonna write out the augmented matrix, but I'll tell you what each one of those values should be my, for my unknowns. My solution for this system is that I get that A0, I'll put it right here, <laughs> is equal to one. B0 is equal to negative two. C0 is equal to, uh, I have three. Okay. A1 is equal to, I have that to be zero. B1 is equal to two. These are nice numbers. This doesn't happen very often. When we get to the cubic spot, you'll see that. And then C1 is equal to negative one. So A0 is equal to one, B0 is equal to negative two, C0 is equal to three, A1 is equal to zero, B1 is equal to two, C1 is equal to negative one, okay? That's what we have. So my spline is going to look like this. S of x, put it right here. I'll box it. My spline looks like this. <clears throat> x squared minus 2x plus 3. x from 1 to 2. And the other one is 2x minus one, x goes from two to three. Okay. And I'm gonna box this guy. I want you guys to notice a couple of things. I hope you've been noticing a few things here. One of the things I want you guys to notice is that when I look at this piecewise function, right, in each one of my individual functions, right, these guys are a polynomial, polynomial of degree two or less, right, because we're dealing with a quadratic spline. So my individual functions, each one of these guys have to be a polynomials of degree two or less. If this is a quadratic spline, it cannot have an x cubed term or x to the fourth term. It has to be x squared x or a constant term that we have for our individual functions, right, which is what we want to see. I want you guys to also notice that indeed, if I were to plug in my values of x, one, two, and three into the spline, I'm going to get two, three, and five respectively, right? Which is what we want to see. And if I were to take the derivative of this function, right? 
and evaluate it at two, you'll see that the derivatives are equal at that location, okay? Which is what we want to see. Last thing, if I, if I were to take the derivative and I plug in one, what should I end up with? If I plug in one into the derivative, I should get zero, right, at the value of one because of that additional constraint that I put on my, on my, uh, my uh, spline. Right. Again, I want to reiterate that this value could have been anything I wanted it to be, but in this case, I chose zero because that's simpler, right? Zero is nice. But there's no magic to it. I could have chosen another value. Okay, so that is quadratic splines. Okay, that's quadratic splines. Now, let's ramp it up even more, right? Let's, let's, let's ramp this thing up more. I said, who, who, who cares? about quadratic splines, cubic splines are the best. Well, you might say that now, but what happens once we actually have to deal with it? So let's talk about the last one, which is cubic splines. Here it is, find the, oh, blue, I don't want blue, I want black. Find the cubic spline going through the points. One, two, two, three, and three, five. I'm not going to draw a picture because it looks very similar to the um, quadratic spline, right? We might have a little bit more of a curve, right? We might have to go up and then down, so it curves twice. But in general, it's about the same type of graph. But we'd be able to get a better approximation because we have that, we have the ability to curve twice within a certain interval for each one of my cubic functions. Right, so what's this guy look like? Just just like we had before, we're going to have now s of x is equal to, instead of having quadratic functions, that we're going to have cubic functions. So we have a0 x cubed right, plus b0 x squared plus c0 x plus d0, right? x goes from 1 to 2. And then the other one is going to be a1 x cubed, right? plus b1 x squared plus c1 x plus d1 x goes from 2 to 3. Okay. This is what we have. All well and good. All right. So we knew when we went to quadratic splines that we did not just doing the interpolation constraint was not enough. So we had to in introduce the first derivative constraint, where the first derivatives uh, are equal where the, the two functions connect, right? And then we had to add an additional constraint, right? So let's, let's just start with what we, we know. We, we know that we have four unknowns per individual function. So we have eight total, right? Eight total unknowns that we need to be able to solve for. That means we need to have eight equations total, right? for our system of equations over there. So we have eight, we have eight unknowns, so we're gonna need eight equations. So let's just talk about our constraints again, right? So what are our conditions here? Well, definitely, we have the same condition we had before, where we have the interpolation constraints. S of i at t sub i had to be equal to f of t sub i the meet at that place. And then s of i at t sub i plus 1 as it equal f sub t sub i plus 1. Okay. So that's going to give me my interpolation constraints. That's 2. Okay. So I need two more, right, I think. So let's look at that. We also need to have what? We need to have that S 
that their first derivatives are the same, right? So where they where they meet, so we have to have the S sub I, right? At T sub I plus one. It has to be equal to S of I plus one. Oh, prime, prime, at T sub I plus one. So this is my first derivative constraint, right? That gives me three. Gives me three. Okay. Uh, then we say, well, that first derivative works so well. If we're dealing with a cubic spline, then I can go to the second derivative. So, so why not say that the second derivatives have to be the same where they meet? So let's do that too. We'll say, okay, okay, the second derivatives have to be the same where they meet. And this is our second derivative constraint. Okay. There's four conditions. Is that enough? Will that be enough to be able to solve this problem? That's the question. Well, we have four, there's four equations here, so let's let's just let's just put them down and see what we get. Just kind of like we did before. I want you guys to also think about, I want you to write out what those conditions are, right? Just like we've done the, the previous time, right? Grab the system. See if we need any more additional constraints, right? So you can pause the video and do that. Write it out and see what you got. Do we have enough equations to be able to solve this problem? Well, I hope you did that. I hope you paused the video and tried to do it yourself and see if you had enough constraints, enough equations to be able to solve this, right? So let's, let's get started where we left off, right? So this is gonna be, here we're gonna have, I'm gonna put it up here. Let's, let's, I know I'm using space. This is really crowded, I apologize, but let's, let's bear with it a little bit. Here is S sub zero of X is gonna be A sub zero X cubed, right? Plus B sub zero X squared plus C sub zero X plus D sub zero. S one X is gonna be A sub one X cubed plus b sub one x squared plus c sub one x plus d sub one, okay? So those are my guys. So what this says, if we go by our constraints, right, let's do our interpolation constraints. We need to have that s sub zero at the value of one, right? Has to be equal to two. S sub zero, at the value of two has to be equal to three. S of one at the value of two has to be equal to three. And S of one at the value of three has to be equal to five. So those are all my interpolation constraints. My first derivative constraint says that the place where they meet, the places where they meet, they have to be equal in terms of their derivative. The only place they meet is at two. So S of zero at two has to be equal to S of one at two. You're like, no, no, Dr. West, that's true, but what you mean is prime. So I want the derivatives at those locations to be equal. And the last one that we have here, the only place where they meet for the second derivative is at two. So we're going to do S of zero, double prime of two, has to be equal to S of one, double prime at two. How many constraints do we have here? Let's count them up. This is like Sesame Street. One, two, three, four, five, six constraints, right? Six constraints. How many constraints do we need if we want to be able to solve uh, for all my unknowns? Again, we need eight constraints, right? We need eight constraints to be able to do that. We need eight constraints to be able to do that. We only have six, so we need to come up with two more constraints, right? And what those two constraints, well, they can be anything you want them to be, right? But there are two traditional constraints that people often use, right? There are two traditional constraints that people often use that doesn't cause any issues later on. So we need to talk about both of those.
Now, what are the two types of uh, constraints that people use, right? They have something called natural constraints. Natural constraints. And they say this, that my second derivative at the endpoints are both zero. My second derivative is at the endpoint of both zero. That way, the, the, if essentially, the function does not curve. It does not curve. It does not bend at my endpoints. So the spline does not bend at the endpoints. It essentially just continues to follow whatever the slope was at that location, right? Remember that the second derivative deals with curvature of a function, right? So essentially, you're saying that there is no curvature of the function at the endpoints, right? So it, it, it keeps that natural slope that it had in the beginning. So this is called the natural constraints, right? So we don't impose any, any curvature on the function at those endpoints. And the other one that we have is called clamped constraints. Clamped constraints. And with clamped constraints, we say that the function, the splines, at the endpoints have to be equal to a certain value. It could be the function, the derivative of the, of the function, or whatever it may be. So we can say this is a z naught, and I'm going to call this one, after the last one, z sub n. Oh, I, I do apologize. That is wrong right here. This should be not s sub 0. This should be uh, n minus 1. s sub n minus 1, the prime of t sub n. Uh, this one is still s of 0. This is s of n minus 1, double prime. And this is going to be s of n minus 1 prime at t sub n is equal to z1. Or these are just any real number values. Z0 and Z1. Now what does this mean? This essentially means that you're forcing, you're forcing the, the spline to bend, uh, to have a certain slope. Here you're forcing the spline to have a certain slope at those points. at the endpoints. Okay. You're forcing the spline to have a certain slope at those endpoints. So it's like it's like using a clamp to force a slope of whatever you want it to be. Just kind of think about putting the screws to it and say I'm going to move you to be a certain to be a certain slope at those particular locations, right? So we have the natural constraints, right? where we have our second derivatives are equal to zero at that location, and then we have the clamp constraints where we're forcing the first derivatives at the endpoints to be a certain value, okay? We're gonna look at both of those situations for the, for the cubic spline. So we're gonna look at the natural cubic spline and then the clamped cubic spline. So the natural cubic spline and then the clamped cubic spline. So let's do that then. Let's um, let's deal with the the first one. Okay. And I'm going to use a different color just to represent the different constraints I could use here. I could add this one right here. S double prime of one is equal to zero, and S double prime at um, sorry, S double prime sub zero. S sub zero double prime at one is zero, and S sub one double prime at my last point, which is three, is equal to zero. Right, this is the natural constraints. 
And the other one is our clamp constraints is that S prime, uh, S sub zero prime at one is equal to, what do I pick? Um, I think I also chose zero. I just want essentially once we get at, at the at the endpoints, we're going to have a horizontal tangent line at that location. So zero. And S, so one prime at three is zero. So I'm going to, I'm going to, when, I, when I solve for my cubic spot, I'm going to use these constraints and these two, or these constraints and these two, right? So either these constraints with the natural constraints or these constraints with the clamp constraints. All right, let's do the um, let's do the natural constraints first. So let's do natural spline. I'm gonna have to erase some stuff. I apologize. Uh, it's, it's probably gonna be this stuff over here. Okay, natural spline. Let's plug in and see what we get. If I start with my first constraint, right, plug in into S of zero, I get A zero plus B zero plus C zero plus D zero is equal to two. Okay. S of zero at two, I get, what's that, eight? Eight A zero plus four B zero plus two C zero plus D zero is equal to three. S of one at two is three, so plug in two into it. S of one, I get eight A one plus four B one plus two C one plus D one is equal to three. Plug in my last value, which is 3 to S of 1, and that becomes 27 A1 plus 9B1 plus 3C1 plus D1 is equal to 5. Okay. I take care of my interpolation constraints. Now I need to make sure that my derivatives are equal at that location, right? My derivatives are equal. Uh, at 2. So let's find out what is the derivative of S of 0. So S of 0 prime is equal to 3A0 x squared plus, was that 2B0? x plus C0, right? S1 prime is equal to the same thing, but instead of A0, we have A1. And let's go ahead and find the second derivative because we know we're going to need it. S0 double prime is equal to 6A0x plus 2B0. And S1 double prime is equal to 6A1x plus, oh, this should be an x here. Thank you guys for telling me about that. Appreciate that. Okay, this should be plus 2B1. Okay. I can feel your vibes. I, I knew that you were saying. You forgot the X, Dr. Wesley. So I appreciate that. All right, so now that we have that, let's, let's do this, this, this equation right here, right? So we have to have the S0 prime at two is equal to S1 prime at two, right? So S0 prime at two is gonna be, what's that? 12 A0, uh, what's that, plus, What's that going to be? 4, B0, is equal to plus C0, is equal to 12A1, plus 4B1, plus C1. Can you see how big this is getting, right? This is huge, right? Uh, and then my, and I'll put the other one here, right? We have that 12. A1, no, I'm on the wrong one, right? We've already done that. So we've done 
This one gives me this one right here, right? Now I'm gonna do the second derivative, right? So second derivative, if I plug in two, what do I get when I do that? My huge system of equations here. I get 12, A zero, 12, A zero plus two B zero is equal to 12A1 plus 2B1. And now, since I'm dealing with the natural spline, right, I'm going to use these natural constraints that I have here, these two guys right here. And what this says is that S double prime at 1 should be equal to 0. So I'm going to do that. It's going to be 6A0 plus 2B0 is equal to 0. And S sub 1 double prime at 3 is also supposed to be equal to 0. So I have to have the 18 A1 plus 2B1 is equal to 0. Okay. All right. So let me double check to see if this is recording. We're doing good. We're at the almost at the hour mark here. Now, do you guys see how much space I have here? I don't have very much space. I would love to write out the augmented matrix for you guys, but I just don't have the space for it. It works the same way it did for the last one, right? With the augmented matrix, right? How many rows will I have for this augmented matrix when I put it into my calculator? I'm gonna have eight rows, right? Eight rows. How many columns am I, am I going to have? I'm going to have nine columns. So I'm going to have eight rows and nine columns, right? When I put this into my calculator, do reduce row echelon form. Do you have to, do you have to do, uh, uh, use a matrix to do this problem? No, you don't. But I like doing it using a matrix. It, it makes my life easy. It's easy for me to check it and make sure I did it correctly. But suppose that you did solve this, right? Suppose you solve this. So what did we get for our solution, right, for our values? I apologize, I had to use even less space than I, I usually use to be able to do these problems, which is, which is terrible. I hope I'm not writing too small. If I am, I'll, I'm going to check after this video to see if it's too small and then I'll write bigger for the other videos if that's the case. I don't think I'm going to redo this video again. I apologize for that too. <laughs> so what do I get when I do this? If I work this out correctly, what do I get? I get this. I get that. Well, let's, let's come over here. Let's, let's get more space. For my solution, I get that A0 is equal to 1 fourth, B0 is equal to negative 3 fourths. C0 is equal to 3 halves. D0 is equal to 1. A1 is equal to negative 1 fourth. B1 is equal to 9 fourths. C1 is equal to negative 9 halves. Okay. D1 is equal to 5. So my cubic spline, let's see if we can write it here, it's going to be this, 1 fourth x cubed minus 3 fourths x squared plus 3 halves x plus 1, x goes from 1 to 2. The second part of this spline is going to be negative 1 fourth x cubed plus 9 fourths x squared minus 9 halves x plus a 5. x goes from 2 to 3. And this is going to be my natural spline. 